Welcome back to the online ministry of Grace Baptist Church. If you're new, welcome. We hope you'll feel at home here and continue to connect, connect with us. Now today we're starting a new series in Romans chapter 6 to 8, and it's called How God Helps Us Change. It's not a topic that I find people understand particularly well, either inside or outside the church. Many people have some sense of what God requires, and they may be aware of how Jesus provides for their forgiveness. But they're stuck there. What do we do between God's requirements and his forgiveness? Interestingly, the two most popular options are presented in the original Lego movie. If you haven't seen it, there's a moral straitjacket approach that's illustrated by a man called President Business. He controls the media, the business, and the government with ads and surveillance cameras that assure that everyone follows his laws. His goal is to use superglue to lock everyone into perfect order. And this is one way that people see Christianity or religion in general. But there's another place in the movie called Cloud Cuckoo Land. There, everybody's dancing and partying with loud music without any rules or laws to follow. When the hero, Emmett, arrives there, he's confused by all the freedom. So he talks to his unicorn kitten guide about it. And yet he, he asks this, there are no signs on anything. How does anyone know what not to do? And she explains, there are no rules. No government, no babysitters, no bedtime, no frowny faces, no bushy mustaches, and no negativity of any kind. <laughs> any idea is a good one, except the not happy ones. Those you push down deep inside where you'll never, ever, ever find them. This, unfortunately, is another caricature of Christianity that some people ascribe to. People either focus on the Bible's commands and use them to police and condemn people, or they fixate on the Bible's freedom and give the impression that Christianity is just a whole pass to sin without consequence. If those are your only two categories for understanding the Christian life, you'll never make progress in becoming more like Jesus. Today, I want to consider how God helps us to grow. And to do that, I'd ask you to turn with me to Paul's letter to the Romans, and I'll start reading in chapter 6, verse 1. If you don't have a Bible, pause the video and open to the passage so you can follow along. Romans 6, verses 1 to 14. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not, therefore reign, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. This is the word of God. Now, this section is answering a question that Paul brings up in verse 1. That's where he asks, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? He's responding to the person who thinks that God's grace and his forgiveness is an invitation to sin. But in answering that question, he gives us an answer to two others 
that sooner or later everyone asks. And the questions are, why shouldn't I sin and how do I stop? If Jesus forgives me when I sin, why should I bother trying to be holy? And if I'm going to stop sinning, then how do I go about it? He gives us neither the moral straitjacket approach of president business, nor the lawless free-for-all path of cloud cuckoo land. He offers a third way that is unrelated to either of those, and he shows how he slashed temptation's tires. The thing that he teaches us, first of all, is that your old life is dead. Don't open the coffin. Trusting in Jesus Christ closes a chapter on our old way of life. God helps us change as we come to terms with that fact. Your old life is dead, so don't open the coffin. Now, in verse 2, Paul answers the question of whether we should continue to sin with the stark phrase, by no means. Some of your translations have, God forbid, or of course not. And then he says, how can we who died to sin still live in it? What is Paul talking about? What's this dying to sin? In verse 2, he says, we have died to sin. In verse 3, he says, all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. He's pointing back to their conversion and saying that everyone who is immersed into Jesus is somehow immersed into his death. Then in verse 4, he says, We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death. And in verse 5, he talks of us being united with him in a death like his. And in verse 6, he says, Our old self was crucified with him. Now, there are five references to our dying in just five verses. So what's going on? We get that it's an emphasis, but what is Paul trying to say? Notice what it doesn't say. Notice that we're not told to do anything yet. Paul is just listing some statements that are true of us as believers. He's not telling us to pretend as if we've died. He's not telling us to play dead when it comes to temptation. And it can't just be saying that we're dead to sin and that we don't feel its allure anymore, because that's just not true. So what is he saying? His message is that when we come to faith, we're so connected and united to Jesus that his death somehow becomes ours. Our old life is behind us now. Now, obviously, physically, we're we're still in the same bodies. But so much that defined our life prior to Jesus is dead and in the grave now. Before we were under God's judgment, we were separated from his love and acceptance. We carried with us the guilt and shame of sin. We were guided by our own wants and desires, and we walked in the way of Adam. That old life, that's dead. The old version of us is buried and in the grave now. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, This death of your old self is a reality, but it's something you have to come to terms with. That's why in verse 11, Paul says, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin. And some of the older translations say, reckon yourselves dead to sin. It's something we need to hear, believe, and trust. We need to reflect on this truth and count on it. Because The problem is we tend to open our coffins. The old self is too familiar. The old ways of thinking about ourselves come so naturally to us. And when we revert back to living like our old selves, we invite the shame and the guilt that we were to leave behind. We hide in the shadows. We keep our distance from God and his people. And that just feeds the power of temptation and sin in our lives. If you're going to grow in godliness, you need to have a funeral for your old self. Take stock of the unbiblical ways that you think about God and yourself. Include the values and the habits, your ways of approaching life and decisions that don't reflect Jesus or his will. And tell yourself, that version of you is dead. He's in the grave, and you're not going to go dig him up again. Now, Philip Yancey tells of how, for Russian writer Fyodor Dostoevsky, An unforgettable experience brought this truth home to him. 
He had been arrested for belonging to a group that Tsar Nicholas I had deemed treasonous. He and the others were dressed in white death gowns, and they were led to a public square where a firing squad awaited. Blindfolded, with their hands bound tightly behind them, they were paraded before the crowd and tied to posts. The firing squad cocked their rifles, and the ready aim order was given. And just as they expected to hear the bullets fly and their lives come to an end, a horseman galloped in with a message from the Tsar that he was commuting their sentences to hard labor. For Dostoevsky, it was like he really had died. As he boarded that convict train for Siberia, a woman handed him a New Testament, which he read insatiably during his imprisonment. Ten years later, When he emerged from exile, he did so with unshakable convictions. He would later write, If anyone proved to me that Christ was outside the truth, then I would prefer prefer to remain with Christ than with the truth. Now, facing a firing squad would be a dramatic way of closing the chapter on an old way of life. The normal way this is done for believers, though, is through baptism. That's why Paul says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? He expects them to know that because converts were likely taught it. Baptism is intended to remind us that our old life is done and behind us. And if you haven't been baptized, this is one of God's purposes for it. If you have, God wants you to reflect on it, to remind you not to pry open the coffin again. Your old self is dead and in the grave. Don't let him keep calling the shots. Now, not only is your old self dead, but your new life has begun. When you trusted in Jesus, God made you profoundly new. And to grow in godliness, you need to lay hold of what he's done. Your new life has begun. Celebrate the birth. Now, in the first point, we we looked at verse 5 where it speaks of being united with Christ in his death. Well, the same verse also says, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Just as Jesus rose from the grave following his death, we who have trusted in him can have confidence that we too will enjoy a resurrection. Our stories are intertwined with his. Now, this is mostly pointing forward, but verse 4 spells out the present implications. It says this, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, listen to him give the purpose now, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. God's plan wasn't just to close a chapter on the old you. He did that so that you might experience a new life. It's like you've been resurrected and now you have a new start. It's not just that you've turned over a leaf and have a fresh start because that would imply that you're just going to go try and repeat the things like before, but you're going to try harder now. No, you are a new person now. You have a new identity as a child of God. You have Jesus on your side. You're a saint. You've been made holy. You've been adopted into a family that will love and support you. You have riches and resources. You have grace and love that were never part of your old life. And as it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Have you come to terms with just how new your life in Christ is? If you try to just start acting more Christian without taking into account the fundamental changes that God has made in you, you'll end up faking it. Try to keep the new commands of the Bible without reckoning with the new life that God has given you, and you'll just go through the motions. That's why verse 11 says, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. We're alive to God, but we need to come to terms with that new life. Things that are new take some getting used to. Babies have to learn to crawl before they walk. And believers need to learn from the Bible new ways of understanding themselves and understanding God. 
He's given us resources of truth and prayer, fellowship and grace. But they're like armor that we need to learn how to wield. When we don't recognize how new our lives are, we walk into spiritual battles alone. And we throw sand at the enemy because that's all that we know. But as God's children, everything is new. We have God's help, God's presence, and God's family to stand with us. And the same things no longer drive us. We're not motivated by guilt or fear anymore. The love of Christ constrains us. We're not living for people's approval or acceptance anymore. Our acceptance in Christ fills us. We don't hunger for this world's riches anymore. Our riches in Christ are more secure than anything our old selves might have chased after. Now, there's a famous story that's told of Augustine of Hippo. His mother was a devout Christian, but he turned his back on God and gave himself to everything in the world he, he could take advantage of. He had a mistress named Claudia. And shortly after his conversion, she saw him on the street and tried to get his attention. She called to him repeatedly, Augustine, Augustine, it is I. But he refused to stop and only replied, yes, but it is no longer I. He was a new creation and he was determined to live in light of who he had become. When you trusted in Christ, Jesus' resurrection became yours. God gave you new life where there was only death. Celebrate your birth. Live like a new creation. Now, we've said that a believer isn't alone in the battle with temptation. Our old life is dead. Our new life has begun. And we need to reckon with those truths to, to hold on to them and to believe them. But finally, this passage teaches us that sin's control over us is broken. It's not that sin isn't present anymore, we don't feel its attraction, but it no longer dominates us. It's not in charge anymore. And we need to live out that conviction. Sin's control over you is broken, so live like it. Now, it's important that we hear what the scripture is saying here. In verse six, when it talks about our old self being crucified with Christ, it says that it was in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. In verse seven, it says, one who has, been, one who has died has been set free from sin. Then in verse 14, it says, sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. The message is that the death of your old self broke sin's hold on you. But be careful to catch the nuance of the words. It's not saying that sin isn't a thing anymore. It doesn't say you can't feel it or you won't get caught up in it or you shouldn't worry about it. Paul very deliberately uses the language of slavery. Our union with Christ in his death and resurrection releases us from sin's enslavement. It's not that we can't sin anymore or that we won't sin anymore, but we don't have to sin anymore. Living the life God calls us to wasn't even possible before you put your faith in Christ. But now a fundamental change has taken place. You're capable of resisting sin and walking in righteousness in a way that you never were before. And we need to act on that truth. In fact, if you read through this passage again, the first 10 verses are just telling us things that we should know. Then in verse 11, we looked at what we need to consider or reckon. And it's not until verses 12 and 13 that we see a therefore and hear that we, what we're to do in response to what all this says. So let's look at that therefore in verses 12 and 13. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. We're to stop giving ourselves to sin. Stop treating sin as if it's still in control of our lives, because it's not. Jesus came to set us free, but sin will take as much authority over us as we give it. It continues to bark orders as if it still owned us, but we don't have to listen anymore. That's what Augustine did when his mistress called to him. He was saying, I'm not that man anymore. I'm not going to be ruled by lust anymore. Jesus freed me from all that. 
Now I give myself to God. And it's not that it isn't a struggle, but this is the battle plan. When we don't do that, sometimes it's because we don't know that we can. We haven't reckoned with the fact that our old self is dead and we really are new creations in Christ. Sometimes there's a refusal to try. We tell ourselves we could never change. It's just who I am. But if you're in Christ, that's not who you are. Sometimes I think we have a case of spiritual Stockholm syndrome. We can act like Jan Erik Olsen's hostages did. He robbed a bank in 1973 and he took four people hostage in a standoff with police that lasted six days. Their hostages defended their captor. They resisted attempts at police rescue. They refused to testify against their captor and some even raised money for his defense. That's because they bonded with the one who had enslaved them and they felt in him some need for safety or acceptance or strength or maybe even love. There are sins in all of our lives that we've bonded over. We've given our loyalty to them. And we didn't just sin because it was wrong. We sinned because it promised us something that we craved. Maybe even something that we felt we needed. If you're going to change, you need to confront that old way of meeting your needs and embrace Jesus as the one who both rescues you and now fills you. He's the one who came to set you free. And maybe the reason you're not growing is that you've never understood faith that way. You put your hand up for forgiveness and going to heaven, but you thought you could keep living under your old master. So let me ask you whether you're still on board. Are you still on board with faith as this passage describes it? Do you put your trust in the Jesus who puts your old life to death? Do you trust in him as the one who nails in a coffin the corrupt version of you that you inherited from Adam? Will you say to the old habits and ways of relating to sin in the world, that's not who I am anymore? In trusting Christ, do you say yes to embracing a new identity and a new calling and a new purpose? Do you give yourself to relying on new resources in the word and prayer and fellowship? Saying yes doesn't mean embracing easy. But by faith, it's at least possible now. Saying yes means entering a war with sin, but it's a war that will end in final victory. And saying yes means turning to Jesus as your first love. Your loyalty is with him now. Sin doesn't owe you anything, and it never could do what Jesus alone can. Now, for the last 2,000 years, people who have embraced faith in this way have expressed that faith through baptism. They've been lowered into the water to declare their old self as dead and in the grave. They've been immersed completely in that water to show that Jesus has cleansed every part of them. And they've been raised out of the water as a way of showing that they've joined in Jesus' resurrection as a new creation. In fact, baptism is God's way of making the truths of this chapter vivid and unforgettable for everyone who trusts Christ. At Grace, we have a long line of people right now who have prepared for baptism and are waiting for this pandemic to end to get in the water. If you haven't been baptized yet, why don't you join them? If you believe in Jesus as this chapter describes, why wouldn't you want to express that as Jesus commands? It's a funeral for what we all need to leave behind. It's a birth announcement for all that Jesus has begun. And it celebrates the gracious cleansing that only he can provide. Let's look to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are such a great rescuer and such a gracious God. We thank you for the freedom that you've set us free. You've helped us to enter into a freedom where now we can be the true version of ourselves, living for your righteousness, living out of devotion to you. And yet, as we enter into this new life, we, we hear the call of the old one. We feel old habits that are familiar, old ways of thinking that, that cause us to stumble. And so help us, Father, to 
leave that old chapter of our lives in the past. Help us to embrace all that is new and to walk into this new life that you have made possible. Right now, Father, we offer the members of our body to you. We give you our eyes, we give you our minds, we give you our hands and our feet, and we ask you to use them as instruments of righteousness. May our lives be given over to you, and may you glorify yourself in us. For we ask you in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I hope this message has helped you to see a Christian's motivation and power in resisting sin. Jesus isn't president in business, and we're not living in cloud cuckoo land. But when we trust in him, our old life comes to an end and a new life begins. There's still a battle with sin, but we have new armor and a savior who leads us in a war that will end in victory. If this is a message you think others need to hear, share the link and help spread the word. And as always, for more messages of hope, go to gracebc.ca. God bless and see you next time.